Okay, hello everyone, and thanks for being here today. Uh, for today's presentation, we have uh, talked about a career journey and lessons learned. And we have the privilege to have with, with us to Monica. Uh, Monica Ansa San, and we practiced this before to, to pronounce her, her last name. So Monica has a degree in civil engineering from the University of Science and Technology in Ghana, a master's degree in geoenvironmental and geotechnical engineering from the Western University in Ontario, and a master's degree in business administration from Haskin School of Business from the University of Calgary. Monica has almost 20 years of geotechnical and tailing engineering experience in consulting, our work mining, and the oil and gas industry in Canada. She is currently the general manager for tailing and dams for Canadian operation of a global mining company. Prior to 2021, she was a technical advisor and closure leader at Shell Canada and Canada Natural in the oil and gas industry. She led initiatives with the Canadian Oil Sand Innovative Alliance uh, to introduce various guidelines and standards on tailing management. She also led the closure of the first tailing facility in the oil sands to be approved under closure and ab an ab abandonment plan by the Alberta regulator. Monica has mentored and continues to mentor engineers and leaders in the mining industry. She has authored and co-authored over 15 uh, technical papers and guides on tailings management and has spoken at conference to promote responsible uh, tailing management. Monica sits on two Canadian provinces boards in Alberta as a public member and director at large. Monica is also the former vice chair of Black Alumni at the Western she loves to hike and bike and enjoying doing this with her husband, Ernest, and his two boys. So we have today a Monica for a presentation that will discuss the career journey of somebody who moved to Canada and the challenges, learnings, and progress along the way. An explanation of how these experiences were utilized to develop their career through healthy work habits and relationship development. This presentation will touch briefly on how to interact with Canadian corporate culture, influence organization, and effect positive changes. So just join me welcoming Monica. Thanks, Daniel. And thanks those who are online and those who are um, also in the conference room there. Um, it's really, um, really happy to be doing this um, today. And obviously, um, as a graduate student, I was also a graduate student. And definitely, I know that it took you a lot of <laughs> energy at this time when maybe exams is nearing to join, um, to listen uh, to me on this. OK, so I'm just going to go through my career journey. I need to make a disclaimer here. Everything that is in here is my opinion and not the opinion of my company. Um, and also, I actually had the privilege to have um, a few friends that also um, gave me ideas and, um, and uh, opinions on, especially the corporate area that I'm going to talk about. So I'm still going to shout out to Agnes. She didn't want me to do this, but Agnes, Josie, Mildred really um, had an input because I just picked their brain on what do you think on that. So um, that's what I've put here compiled, but um, I did get um, a bit of support on it. So thank you very much uh, for that. So now really going into this, so it will be, the career journey will be some on a personal note, and then I'll go into the professional and also my work as well, okay? So I'll just go through a background of my family um, and then my education, um, the influences along the way, and then I'll touch on how to integrate into the corporate culture, and then I'll go into key learnings um, as well, okay? So this is me as a kid, um, six years old. Um, Daniel, can you hear me? Everything is good? Daniel, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay, good. Um, so this is me um, at six years old. Okay, first, it's me as a baby with my mom <laughs> there, the first one. 
And then this is me at six years old with my siblings. Uh, on the right side, that's the house I grew up in. I'm originally from Ghana. Um, I came here in 2002. So um, that's where um, I grew up until I was 20 something. And then I came here. Okay, so I'm originally, those who don't know where Ghana is, it's in West Africa, snugged out um, close to the coast. So that's, that's where I came from. My mom is a retired nurse. And my dad was actually um, an economist and then did law as well. So my dad kind of went through the civil service. He was a speechwriter for the uh, vice president of the Third Republic and then went on to write a lot of speeches and help with the economic and strategic goals of Ghana. So basically, that was the area that he worked in. So I grew up with seeing my mom and my dad uh, work um, together. But then along the way, my mom um, came home and had to stop working because he had a lot of, every time he had to be, he was always in the surgery room emergency, that's where she worked. So with all of us, it was a lot. So she made that decision rather to stop working and then start a business. So she, actually at a young age, I saw that flexibility where you could do that. So that's something that was imprinted in my head. And up till now, she's a retired nurse and she still runs her businesses, okay? Unfortunately, my, my dad passed away quite early when I was in third year. So um, I know he's proud of me and probably still proud seeing me um, and given this, okay? So this is how I grew up. So I grew up in Ghana, like I said, um, that's the house I grew up. These are the streets that um, I played on until so many years. And I'll talk more as we go. So now I've talked about myself with my family. We are very close knit, like I'm the second of four siblings. And up to today, even though we are at different parts of the world, we are very, very close um, to each other. And then now I go to my other family as I grew up. This is my kids, uh, my husband, big supporter of everything that I do. And as we came here, we came here, like I said, um, years ago, and um, I had to always take my kids for soccer. And so I, I developed a real, I mean, Ghana loves soccer. So I developed a real joy for soccer. I started playing as well as my kids. I managed my kids' soccer team. And then um, eventually I played and then I went into refereeing, right? My kids love to ski. We lived in Fort McMurray and in the schools, they'll teach you how to ski. So they skied. And then even when we moved to Calgary, they still skied a bit. So once in a while, I tried with them. I'll tell you, disclaimer, I don't ski. They do. I try to with them once in a while. But what I do, and Daniel did mention it, I love to bike and hike. And I'm sure there are some people on the call that I do that with. So I, I really love to hike and bike as well. And so this is my family. And um, this has been my support, okay, throughout my whole career. And I have to say that this has been my support. They have been my checks and my balances and everything that I'm going to talk to you about. This is the family that has been there to support me um, throughout this whole career journey. And that's not something I take lightly. I'm really blessed to have had that. And so now I'll go into schooling, okay? So <laughs> you can see here, this is the school that I went to. So um, in Ghana, we have the British system. So you go into boarding school. So at 12 years, on the left-hand side, that's the school that I went to, Holy Child Catholic School. And um, this symbol is very symbolic to us because we had nuns that were teaching us and they taught us a lot, everything that we knew from how to hold the cutlery to how to sit and eat and everything, okay? And also taught us education. So that is a school that we, we really treasure. It's been one of the things that has brought me a lot of the discipline that I see that I have now, the resilience and also the collaboration that I have. Why do I say that? We all went there as kids and you can see on the second page, you see a, a bunch of us there. That was when we were almost with the British system, you go into sixth form. And that is, that is all of us going through it from form one all the way to sixth form. That is seven years where we all kind of got to know each other. They became like the second sisters that you had. I mean, fortunately for me, my sister was also at the school. So it made it easier where I had that. And at the same time, I had these friends that we are still friends. It's more than 35 years since we left um, Holy Child School and we are still friends. And I know some of them are actually online right now, listening in and supporting me on this. So it was an amazing experience to be in the school and to learn the discipline, the structure. And then that is what actually excelled me into um, 
University of Science and Technology where I went in to do civil engineering. So on the third picture on the right, this is um, five, four of us were female. There were about 53 in the class and four of us were female. Okay, so four of us graduated from civil engineering at the time in my undergrad. And unfortunately, I don't have a, a picture from Western University because I did not go for my graduation, but that's a school that also built me up. So for my undergrad, I learned a lot of analytical, um, critical thinking, and I'm sure a lot of you see that as well, all your analytical and everything. And then I went into the master's where now you go more into the research area where you are now thinking more and deeper about the things that you've learned in your undergrad. So that is something that I learned from Western. And at Western, there was a huge Ghanaian community that supported all of us, taught us as a young immigrant what you have to do, how you have to navigate the system. So that's something that I'm really, really grateful for as well. And I'm sure some of our Western folks are online. So um, that, was, that was also an amazing experience. So after that, if, after going to Western, I started working. But I'll talk about my work life later, but I want to finish it off with um, I, the schools that I went to. So after that, I took a master's in business administration. So I took it at the University of Calgary at Haskane. So you can see that um, these are the pictures. And um, just yesterday, I was joking with them that, hey, I'm going to have your picture here. And we're, we're all joking and saying, oh my goodness, we looked so young. And that was just in 2019, right? So this was an amazing experience for me as well. It taught me a lot of things. It taught me how to really look at different things because I was coming from a really strong technical background, okay? And the strong networks that we formed. And up till today, we still use those networks. So that was an awesome experience at Haskane, a school of business that I will not forget. And I still have the friends that we grew up with. And actually there's one that um, two of us that are gonna go out um, for coffee um, in two weeks. So that was a strong and amazing experience as well. So that is my schooling. This is what made me who I am, okay? So you can see that I learned my discipline as a kid going to boarding school. And then I learned a lot of my critical thinking in undergrad. I learned a lot of my research skills, going more deeper and strategic uh, as well there. And then when it came to how to follow the strategic goals and be able to implement it whilst looking at cost as an engineer, that is where the MBA also helped to complement that as well. So those were the experiences that I had um, in schooling. And then, so how did I use it? So now I come into my work base, okay? So um, when, I finished, um, when I finished my master's in um, um, civil eng engineer, like geotechnical in, uh, at Western, um, I got the opportunity to work with a company in Sudbury. And one thing that really caught on to me was I went into the interview and actually at that time, and I'm sure some of you might not remember, but before Google Maps came, we used MapQuest, okay? And so I had to drive to Mississauga and then the, the MapQuest who didn't get this new area, I was 30 minutes late for the, uh, for the interview. I almost didn't go in. I remember I went with my husband and he said, you were just go in and explain what happened. So I went in and the gentleman was there actually waiting. So I went in and I explained and he's like, no, that's fine. And then the gentleman actually uh, interviewed me. So um, I did tell him I was going to mention his name, Bob Powell. So Bob Powell, actually an alumni of U of A, was the one that interviewed me at the time and then said, you know what, I'm going to take you. I believe that you do very well. And then Bob hired me on the spot. The other reason he also hired me was the fact that he had worked with a Ghanaian before. Okay, So that is one learning that you should get out of this. Anywhere you are and whoever you are, you need to make that impact because you're also going to help someone, okay? You need to make that positive impact. So Bob said, you know what? I worked with a Ghanaian. His name is Kofi. He was a good friend of mine, very collaborative. You know, I'm going to hire you. And that was how my career journey started in Canada, just because he believed in me and also somebody had proven that I can also do the job. So it's very, very important that we also look at that. So that was how my journey started. And then I was in Sudbury and then we moved to Fort McMurray. So the pictures that you see me with my hard hat and all that, that is in Fort McMurray when I worked in the oil sands. And I worked with an amazing team there. Lorraine is in the picture. She's probably listening, but we had such a journey together um, in Fort McMurray. And then I got a lot of my experience from there, completely different from what I experienced in the 
in hard rock mining at the time. So a lot of my experience came out of um, working up in Fort McMurray, okay? And then just as I mentioned to you, I looked at flexibility. My kids needed certain needs that were in Calgary. And so I made a decision similar to what my mom did. And I made a decision to move to Calgary. And then I had the opportunity to move to another company in Calgary. And so I worked with Shell Canada at the time. And that was a completely different experience, right? So here it was a little bit different. And I have to say that that was where I got the opportunity to write papers. And um, I did not take that for granted. One thing that I didn't mention that Bob really helped me with, okay? So when I came in, remember I came from a British system. So sometimes you write more like the British system than the Canadian system. That is one thing that Bob helped me out with. Anytime I wrote, he helped me, told me this is how it should be written. It's still English, but it needs to be written for the audience. And I, I, it's something that I was really grateful for. I listened. And then throughout that, when I went into Shell, it became a big tool for me. I was able to write. I'm able to edit. I look at things. I look at it differently. And that really, really helped me. So out of Shell, I did publish a lot of technical papers. And you look at a lot of papers, I published a lot of them came out of Shell. But I still got the support of my uh, management to do that. And that's really, really important because those things aligned with the strategic goals that they were looking at. And so it was, it was just an amazing experience to do that. And then we continued that to um, Canadian Natural when Shell sold the asset to Canadian Natural. So there we had to integrate into the culture, which was great. I mean, looking at the fact that I came from Syncret before then, the culture wasn't too, too different. So we did integrate. And I know there's a lot of us that came from Albion to, um, from Shell to CNRL. And it was still the same amazing experience. I had the opportunity to write papers. And then also at the time, um, I did a lot of technical work, but now I'd almost finished my master's, right? So now I was looking more on the leadership side, how I could integrate that. And basically that is how I started it. So I had the opportunity as well, if you look on the right side, to manage the geotechnical review board um, at Shell as well. So a lot of that management and that um, kind of leadership came out of that. So I was there as a leader, but without inf uh, not with influence, but without authority. And that was that's one of the things that I was surprised that I was able to do well, because here you are, you need to get people on board, but you don't have the authority to do it, but you need to influence. And that has been a skill that has stuck with me for a long time. So throughout um, that work experience with Shell and Canadian Natural, we had a lot of fun and we did a lot of things, but I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I just decided to pick two and then talk about them. But before I move to those two, I also need to talk about the fact that when I was at um, Canadian Natural, obviously after doing my MBA, um, I kind of decided, okay, now I'm going into leadership. At the same time, is there an opportunity for change? So I got that opportunity with Valet. And there what happened was the fact that they were trying to implement a system. So the challenge was, this is the system, implement it, and then run it. So that was a huge challenge and an opportunity. It was a little bit outside my comfort zone, but I thought, you know what? And after discussing it with my family, obviously, um, we agree that I should take that risk. So that is one other thing that you should look at. When, I mean, you have a goal, this is what you want to do. But when an opportunity comes, you should take that opportunity or take that risk to say, you know what? I'm going to try this out. Maybe it will work. And then you go and it will work. Sometimes it won't work. Sometimes it will work. But that's the opportunity that you need to take. Um, one thing I should also mention, as I talk through this journey, let us remember that everybody might have it differently. This may have worked for me. It doesn't mean it will work for you as well. But it's a guide for you to know where do I want to land, okay? So continue with my story. I ended up with Valley. So on the right-hand side, that's a group of us. We went to the Tailings and Mindways conference and we did take a picture. So it's been an amazing family and I've had so much fun um, doing the work that we are doing and trying to implement a Tailings and Dams management system there. So still talking about my work, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about two things that we did and the learnings that I got out of it. Okay, so there's one paper on the left. It's uh, the closure and abandonment process for an oil sands tailings facility. 
So this is a paper that I think that was the last papers I wrote um, before I left Canadian Natural. And um, this I wrote, and a shout out to Derek. I know he wasn't able to join, but a shout out to him. We wrote it together with Joe Quinn. And the learning that I got out of this as I led this project, and not the paper, is the collaboration that you need to get things done, okay? And so one thing that I realized was this. When you start a project like this where there's a lot of stakeholders, the first thing you need to implement is the race matrix. So you implement that to look at who is responsible, who is accountable, who needs to be consulted and who needs to be informed. So when that is laid out and everybody knows when they are supposed to come in into the project, it makes it easier. I found out to have made this um, project very, very successful because it was one of the first that we closed in the oil sands. The other thing is also to realize something that in meetings, you might have different people in there, okay? Sometimes as engineers, we already think we know what the answer is, but remember that there are people in the meeting that need to be heard and you need to be able to hold hands along with them to the goal that you want to get to. And what happens is that in the end, with the people in the meeting, they might be in different meetings that you are not in. And that is when they champion you and they know the work that you are doing. And based on that, it generates good performance for you. Okay, And good performance is what always pays off. People need to see that you are performing. Okay. And so that was one other thing that I learned where you really need to get everybody on board. You really need to get people going. You have to put a schedule together. You need to put the timelines together, right? There are some that may not meet it. There's reasons for it. You talk to them and then you keep going. So the closure and abandonment project that I did was an amazing one. I worked with amazing people um, to get it through. But that was the big thing that I realized. The racy is so critical. You need to put it together to make sure that there isn't any confusion as you go along and really understand the processes that you, you need to use. Sometimes you think of some and you adjust and other times so you have to recognize that, hey, this is the path that we need to go on. When you are very structured, okay, and sometimes as engineers, we are very analytical and structured. Sometimes you might lose the fact that you need to be able to adapt to change because you might start the project that way. And then maybe, and I love my mining engineers, the mining engineer might come and say, well, I don't think I want this here because, and, but the big thing is ask the reason. Is there any reason why? And you might realize that, hey, the whole distance is too long. The cost is too high. So that's why I'm trying to optimize. So if they are trying to optimize, it tells you, you need to also look at yours and optimize it. In the end, make it safe but just think about that optimization instead of closing it off that, no, this is how it should be because everybody's looking at what is best um, suited for them. So that is one of the projects. The other project I worked on was the, the deep deposit guide um, under COSIA. So I was the co-chair with another gentleman. And in fact, I was the only woman in that um, group. And I'm so proud of this because it took us a lot of discussion for us to get closer to soft deposits and see how they work but we did the work like very persistent. We had it together line by line. We went through it and I'm sure if some of our line will see how painful it was, but in the end we created a really good document, but it was all about collaboration because think about it. You have people from different companies, all of us trying to get one goal. So there had to be a lot of collaborations and geotechnical engineers have a lot of opinions, but we had to converge these opinions to be able to get to the middle ground. Here, what really helped me was my MBA because there I'd learned about perspective, right? So sometimes I would just ask the question. And also I learned a lot about people's personalities here. And that's something that when you work with people, you need to understand their personalities. There are some that will never talk, but they have great ideas. So sometimes you have to say, oh, what do you think? And then you see that you get those ideas from them. So getting to know their personalities are really, really, really important. And that is what we did here. And I'm really proud of this other work that we did. And obviously these are public documents that are available for you to read, but it was really something that I was really um, happy about. So now still moving on, because what I'm trying to do is I want to leave uh, quite a bit of time so that we can have um, a lot of questions. So these are the influences that were in my life. And I think I talked about it quite a bit there, especially my family. Faith was a big thing 
um, in my life right from the beginning. And you could see it. And as I talked about the boarding school and everything that I went. So that was a big thing in my life. My, my husband and my kids, resilience has been one big thing as well um, for me, my brothers, my sisters. And then hope and positivity. And that's a big thing where every time there might be some challenges with different things, but what you always have to look at is what is the positive that came out of it, okay? Don't think about the negative. What is the positive that came out of it? And, and that's, that's all you, you, need to, to, you need to think about, right? You might go for an interview, okay? I've gone for some interviews that I was never taking for the job. But the first thing I think about is, you know what? I didn't get it, but what can I learn from it? Oh, maybe I have to improve on this side and this side for myself, right? Or maybe, you know what? This job really wasn't for me, but you need to learn out of it because there is a positive that came out of it. Or maybe, you know what? It helped you to practice your interview skills. That's a positive that came out of it. So that is everything that you do. Think about that. What positive came out of it, right? What positive came out of it? So these are the influences, like I talked about, that have helped me. My co-workers, I've worked with amazing people. My friends, um, my mentees. I have a lot of mentees, and they also taught me how to listen, right? Because they'll call me and say, Monica, this is the issue. And then I have to listen. So it really brought out the listening skills in me as well. So there's been a lot of influence. And of course, my mentors, I didn't have a lot of mentors, but the mentors that I had really helped me and were amazing. Okay? So those are the influences that I have in my life. And so now switching back, because I talked about the corporate culture, how do you integrate? Because sometimes the corporate culture is a little bit different and there's a way that we want kind of want things done. So you see that as I talked, I talked about structure. Structure is so important, especially when you start nipping into corporate culture, okay? So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and then obviously when I finish, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to ask um, questions. So to integrate, the first thing, if you want to work with a corporation, mining, anything, when you get there, you need to learn how the organization works, okay? You need to understand the culture and how it works. It's so critical. And how do you do it? You observe in meetings, you listen in meetings, you see how people interact, you see how people walk over, okay? I've worked with a lot of companies. I see companies where someone always wants to walk from their office to the next office to have the discussion. There are others that just want to pick the phone and have the discussion. There are others that always want to have it in a, in a, in a Teams meeting, okay? These are different cultures. So when you enter an organization, you need to see which one works, okay? There are some that they want you to work there. To them, that's collaboration. When you call someone to that person, it's collaboration. But you need to understand how the, how the culture works and be able to tailor yourself to that culture. Majority of companies have visions and values, okay? Um, some people read it and think, oh, it's just visions. And no, the vision and values is something you need to be aligned to. Because if you want to make meaningful contribution to that company, you need to be aligned with their visions and value, okay? If their vision and value is zero harm, it means that they have a high safety culture. So if you are somebody that is weak in situational awareness, you will have challenges. So those are the things that you really have to look out for. One other thing is corporations are strict in safety culture. Like I mentioned, zero harm. So you need to obey the rules. It's zero tolerance for unsafe work. And I know some of my colleagues online will tell you the same thing. When you sit in a track, there are rules. Walk around the track, make sure everything is good. You have to fill a form. Zero. You need to do all of that. Okay, so you need to obey the rules. You need to obey the process. So if you're somebody that doesn't have that kind of, you are more, I want flexibility, I want fun, and you are not very structured, you might have um, a few challenges. And in that case, it means that now you need to change your behavior to be able to tailor to how the corporation works, okay? And the other thing is you need to be receptive to constructive feedback for continuous improvement. That is how I have approved, uh, improved. I'm not perfect, I'll tell you that. 
And all those that know me will tell you I'm not perfect. I am not a perfect person. But what I strive to do is that when people give me feedback, I want to improve on that. And then next time I'll come and ask you, okay, how did I do this time? Okay. So I do give presentations every time. Okay. But I had friends, I said, you know what? Hey, just join and tell me how I did. That's continuous feedback. It's so important to me. So that the next time I do another one, I can improve on it. And that's that's how you grow as a person. That's how you're going to grow as a student. Okay. And then the other thing, learn from your mistakes. Okay. You make a mistake, just acknowledge it and improve it. Okay. I remember one time um, I had, um, we were in a meeting and one gentleman, and every time I heard him say it, right, then he say, shame on me for forgetting to invite you. I was shame on me that I didn't do this work before I came here. And, and I kept going, I'm like, and then I realized what he was doing. He's acknowledging the fact that he should have done that and he didn't do it, right? But he's apologizing for not having done it and hoping to do it better next time. So that's, that's one thing that I, I, I learned out of it as well. And the other thing is you need to take responsibility for your action, whether it's positive or negative, okay? You did something, something happened, I'm responsible for it. This sits with me and then you move on from there and improve on it, okay? I, I manage an area. If something happens within the area, I'm responsible for it. And I need to make sure that it doesn't happen again the next time because I have to learn from it. If we don't learn from it, it means we don't improve, okay? And another thing that corporate culture is collaboration and positive relationships, okay? You really need to form your bridges and maintain positive work relationships and strong networks. I've, we finished our MBA in 2019 and I still keep those networks. It's so important. Um, you need to maintain those positive work relationships so that um, in doing that, you realize that even when you leave a, a, a company, you're still talking to the people that are there because they become more, no more colleagues at work, but now they are your friends, okay? You catch up with them, you see how life is going and then things like that. So, so those are the things. You need to keep those positive relationships. Our field and our, our system is, is very, very small, right? It's a small world. So those positive relationships will project into the good performance that will let someone recommend you um, for um, a, another opportunity, a, great, a better opportunity than what you have. So those ones are very, very important. Form your bridges, maintain them, don't burn them, okay? And then keep those strong um, networks. And then another thing is look for a mentor, okay? So that's one thing that in organization, I didn't, I didn't really know that. Didn't have, men, didn't have mentors for years. I took one, um, not really a mentor, but... I, I seek advice from her um, for things like that. But one thing I've realized is that when you go into an organization, look for a mentor. Look for someone you look up to, someone that can support you, someone that can help you, someone that you can bounce things off. So that as you work through the organization, there are some things that you might not know and the person will guide you through that. So it's, it's always important. Your mentor could be your manager, okay, because I mean, I never had mentors and I always bound things off my manager, but it's always helpful, especially when you are a young grad that you are starting out to have a mentor. It really, really helps uh, to navigate you through um, the system. Another thing is you need to set your goals, okay? The company will not set them for you. The company has a vision and value and they have a strategic goal, but out of that, you need to set your goal with your manager. And then when you said it, most managers will support you and keep going. But one thing you need to realize, it's a goal that should align with the company's strategic goals. So that is how you look at it. If the company is saying zero, um, we always need to be safe, zero harm, you set your goals according to that. If the company is saying risk management, obsession with safety, risk management, you set your goals towards that because that is what the company is looking at strategically. And then you work that through with your manager. One other thing, you need to be flexible and adaptive to change. And the reason I say that is this, and some might tell you, they've been in organizations where the organizational chart will change, okay? The organizational chart will change. 
Sometimes when you are too structured, it becomes a bit stressful for you. But you need to try and be adaptive to change. These things happen. Some changes bring opportunities for you, okay? So that is how you should look at it. Always look at the positive. How is this going to work? Embrace it. And then suddenly you see that it brings an opportunity for you. So always be flexible and adaptive to change. And that really, really helps. And you can see that if you look at a lot of work and when we were in MB, we used to do this, where those who are really adaptive to change tend to be really good leaders because anything comes at them, they are able to adapt very quickly and then, and then change to what is coming at them. So a lot of good leaders are able to do this. So this is something that is really, really good if you are able to get that skill. Okay, um, one thing, be humble, okay? And you're gonna hear me say that all the time, be humble. Learn along the way, don't jump quickly through your journey, okay? When you jump too many times, you lose gaps within um, the journey that you're going in your career. And then you're gonna realize that suddenly you are so far into your years of experience and probably you don't even know how to drill, right? So be humble and learn. Ask the questions, ask the questions, and then you grow. And then suddenly you see that you're getting your experience and you're going through that journey, right? Because sometimes all of us, yes, compensation is so important. So suddenly we are here for a year and then we see that, oh, this compensation is a little bit harder and then we jump. But remember, you need to learn and be able to say, you know what, I have this kind of experience. Then you start looking at opportunities as well. So something that um, I thought I should give to you as um, students as well, be humble and learn, okay? There's a difference between ego, confidence and humility, okay? You can be humble and confident, okay? But sometimes when you let ego comes in, then it becomes a different thing. So that's something that uh, we need to look at as well. Um, another thing I'll say in a corporate culture is focus on your strength, okay? You need to be the best version of yourself and improve on your weaknesses. So we did, a, I think it was a paper that talked about that. Remember something, if something is your weakness, okay? It is somebody's strength and the person will focus on that strength and go higher than you. So you need to focus on your strength, increase it and become the better version of yourself for performance and still improve your weaknesses. And that's the continuous improvement that I was talking about, right? So that is what um, you have to do. Work for good performance and not a position. So this is something that a friend we're just chatting and, and Mildred just talked about it, that someone said it for her and she's never forgotten it. Work for good performance and not a position. If you have it in your mind that look, this is my manager, I want to be, I want to have my manager's position, okay? Number one, you're always going to see something wrong with what your manager does because that's the position you are striving for. And you're always going to criticize what the person internally or with other people, not that you are telling him or whatever, but that is what you're going to look at. But think about it. If you are working for good performance, you are looking at your work. You are looking at the quality of your work. You are collaborating with people. People are seeing how you conduct yourself in meetings, the behavior, how you're working, how you're progressing. That is the good performance that people are going to go ahead and say, wow, this person is really hitting the mark, hitting the mark. And you know what happens? A big opportunity comes and everybody in the room is saying, give it to her, give it to him. This person can do it. So that good performance just opens uh, doors of opportunity. And that's what we should always look at like, okay? And then work-life balance. I, 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 won't, I won't lie to you, that's important. Did I miss some of my kids' soccer games? Yes. Now I look back and now they are grown in the university and I'm like, oh, I wish I had was able to go for that game. But the nice thing I did is I still have memories of my kids riding a bike, doing that, poem recitals. Yeah, I wasn't able to go for all of them, but you need to balance that. You need to be able to balance it. Have time for your family because at the point where there's a lot of stress at work or there's a stressful situation, it's your family that will hold you up. And, and that's something that we should never forget. It's your family that will hold you up, okay? That is what every time I come, like, I tell my husband, look at what happened. And then he's like, calm down, you see? And then I get calm and then we go from there. So that balance of family, being with your family together, being able to talk, that is, that is, that is so important, okay? And one other thing I wanted to add, you have to be open to different perspectives, 
Okay, that's one thing I learned um, as I went through um, um, management. Now that I'm more into management now, you always have to sit back and let other people talk of these perspectives and, and see where it goes. Because sometimes you might think I want to be at A, okay? And then suddenly the different perspectives will bring a better version of A. And it's so important because now the better version of A has made you guys successful. The whole team, very, very successful. So you always need to listen to different perspectives. Obviously, as a manager, there are times where you need to decide because if it's if it's something coming from the top that this is what needs to be done, this is what needs to be done. There are other areas where you know that this is something that you can open it up for different perspectives and then go ahead and do that and then listen to diverse opinions. And then in the end, you see that you have a product that works and that is really good. So I would, I would, I would tell you, when you do that, um, look at those different perspectives. And also in looking at perspective, I think I mentioned about that. When you work with your folks and when you work with your team, always look at personalities in the team, okay? It's so important. The personalities in the team that I worked with when I was at Syncrude were totally different from the personalities in the team that I worked with when um, I was at Shell, okay? And it's totally different from the personalities that I'm working with right now. But you always need to look at that and be able to be mindful and sensitive to how um, some personalities perceive things and how you need to explain things, okay? And also within a team, there are some that will get it in one minute. There are others that it will take a bit of time to get. So you need to be able to adjust how you work and be able to say, you know what? We need to bring this person along the way. And they will always be grateful for, for that as well. So this is something that, especially in the corporate culture, you really need to watch out for that as well, okay? If you want to be successful. So now I'll wrap it up so that we can have a, a few questions here, but basically the key learnings, um, and I hope that you got this out of all the talk that I've done, um, is this, you need to be goal oriented, you need to have a goal, okay, wherever you go, you need to have a goal that this is what I want to do, okay, in five years, where do I see myself, okay, always focus on the positives in every situation or outcome, okay, that is what you need to focus on. I didn't get this interview. At least I've practiced how to do an interview, okay? I didn't get this job because of this. Okay, now let me go and look at that and then read on it because now I see that I've received some feedback. So that is so important. Always focus on the positives in every situation uh, or outcome. Find what motivates you in your career, okay? Because you always need to have passion, okay? If we went to a tailings and mine waste in Vancouver last year, uh, last week, yeah. And if you see the engineers standing there talking about tailings, that was passion. They love what they do. They breathe it, okay? So we're all there just chatting and talking. And, and I was there with my friend, Josie, like we were all just full of passion talking about it. And that's what motivates our career. So you need to do what you love. And you can see that because you love it, you put in so much and the good performance comes out of it, okay? And I talked about it. Don't strive for position. Strive for good performance, okay? And this is a quote that I got from, uh, from a friend. Strive for good position. Uh, strive for, don't strive for the position. Strive for good performance. And then when you have very good performance, any opportunity comes, there you go, okay? And embrace discipline. And I talked about that. Embrace discipline in the corporate culture, there are things that you need to do. Embrace that discipline and self-control. There are a lot of things that are outside your control. Try and improve the ones that are within your control, okay? If it's outside your control, you can't control it. Improve it and then embrace that as well. And I talked about knowing the personalities of the work and people you work with, very, very important. And the last that I wanted to leave you with, and I repeated it so many times, be humble, be humble, be humble. It's so important. There are awesome engineers out there and they are so humble when they do their work. It's just amazing. And that really brings out the best in them. And that also projects the good performance. So this is something that um, is very, very important for us that we look at. Always be humble in your work. So when you make a mistake, everybody knows, you know what? She's recognized it. He's recognized that it. it's not going to happen again. So be humble, 
be humble, be humble. We do not know everything. So you need to be humble about that. So I just left these references here because um, I picked some of my uh, stuff and my story from some of these articles that were done um, for me. Shout out to Teresa, I'm sure she's online. Uh, she did one on inclusion and, and advisory committee for mining. Um, and it was more on how I grew up as a, a little girl. And then there was one that was done on Valley News for celebration of Black History Month. So a lot of my story there, I put it together. So these are also available that um, you can look. But basically, um, this is the end of my presentation, Daniel, and I'll open it up for questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, so if there is any question here in the room, let me know for the people that is online, you can unmute yourself or send your question in the chat. So any question in the room? No. People in the room is shy. No, they are not. I would like to work. Just in a minute. Okay. Oh, cool. It's working. Hi. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, uh, earlier you had commented on how it's important to take those risks, even if, like, sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. Um, I'm wondering if you could maybe speak to a time that you took a risk and it didn't really work out the way you thought. Um, I think your your voice was a bit muffled. I didn't hear. Daniel, can you repeat it for me? What was the question? Uh, yes. She was asking, uh, you, you were talking about taking risk. So most of the time we see the risk that works. But if you were able to share us uh, risks that doesn't work and uh, when those happen and what to do. Oh, okay. And, and, and so it comes back to the positives that I talked about. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll give you a story because you've said it out. I'll, I'll give you a story. So when I was in Sudbury, okay, I, um, I was working in consulting. My husband was as well. And I had two kids under the age of five. Okay. Two boys under the age of five. It was too much for us. So I took the option to rather go into industry where it was a little bit, the timelines were not as strict as, um, um, it would be in um, in consulting, okay? So I took that risk and I went, okay? And then two years later, there was a downturn, okay? Metal prices collapsed and everything and 700 of us were laid off and I was one of them, okay? So I took that risk, but it happened. But you know what? When that happened, I looked at the positive side of it and I remember when they called me and gave me my package, I said, thank you very much. You gave me a year. I'm sure I'm going to get a job within a few months. And I remember the gentleman sitting there chuckled a little bit because he thought there were no jobs because the downturn had happened. OK, and truly three months after I got the job with uh, with Syncrit. So that was a risk I took. It didn't work out and um, I still picked myself up. I was very positive. I had faith that I'll get it. Another one. And. I said it out aloud and, and it happened. And that is how I ended up in Fort McMurray and had amazing friends and worked with a lot of people there. So I think the big thing is how you pick yourself up. Always look at the fact that you know what? One door has closed, another, another one would open. Okay, thank you. There is a question or a comment in the chat. Where is my mouse? Okay, no, just people saying great presentation, Monica. Thank you, Monica, for an excellent presentation. Okay, any other question here in the room? I have a question, Daniel. Yes, I, please. Okay. So I'm Cynthia, and uh, what a nice, nice day. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's been better because I hear uh, Monica present. We go very far back, and uh, beautiful story, Monica. Uh, okay. You really encourage all of us. Uh, you make us proud. Um, we thank God for you. Beautiful. So I have a, a quick question, perhaps two uh, questions. 
And I hear you, uh, of course, an immigrant. Um, you talked about some of the challenges, beginning with language, adapting to the way of speaking, writing, uh, mostly. Um, can you shed a bit of light on how you navigated uh, your difference as far as uh, some of these uh, differences in speaking? And I know you touched on it a little bit, but as you got, got deeper in your career, can you tell us one or two things that stood out that uh, you you overcame. Uh, secondly, you talked about your family. And of course, when uh, you want to have the best of good wealth, you don't want to miss out on being a mom, being a mother, being a wife and all of that. I wonder how your femininity played in a very male dominated work environment. Uh, okay. Give us a sense of how that was also for you and what uh, we could learn from it. Thank you. Okay, no, thanks, Cynthia. And Cynthia is right. We go a very long way, years and years and years, probably 20. Um, so in terms of um, the language and the writing, I, I like I said, I was very lucky. Bob Powell, who is an alumni for U of A, actually I got lucky, sat me down and said, Monica, this is the British way of writing. In Canada, you need to look at the audience. So anytime that I did a report, he would mark it all up in red and then I'll go through it and then I'll see, okay, this is what he's saying. This is what he's saying. Another thing that I also used a lot was when people send emails, okay? I read their emails. I see how they are communicating and then I was picking up on that as well, okay? I came from an English speaking country, but all of it was more on the British side compared to that here. So that was one thing. Another thing I also did, and it was a I got from, I think someone that we were working with at the time. And he said, you know what? If you really want to be a good public speaker, you should also look at Toastmasters, okay? So Toastmasters was another one. And I actually recommended it to another mentee to, to go look at it. And, and he's really done well there too. So it's for those that don't like presenting, you go there and then you do it and they critique you on how things work. So that also, I did just a few of it, but that also um, really helped as well. And then in terms of communication, I think my kids also helped me, okay? Um, generally, Ghanaians talk slowly. I think I'm a little bit of an outlier. I talk a bit fast. So I had to learn to talk slowly. When you talk slowly, everybody hears you. Everybody understands you. When you talk too fast, they can't hear you because Canadians talk a little bit slower than us immigrants, okay? And I'm talking about me. So that was another thing that I learned. And I learned it from my kids because sometimes they are like, mom, you're talking too fast. And then I check myself, okay? Sometimes in meetings, when I finish, I'll go and ask my boss, how did that work? I always ask for feedback for communication. And then he's like, yeah, it went well, but then sometimes you went too fast and like, oh, and then I put it on next time, go slowly, right? And so those are the things that I really, I, I was very sensitive on and, and work through just so that I know what I was doing. And then another thing too was, I mean, you have to look at your audience and I learned that from Bob Powell, but as I went through, I realized that, I mean, sometimes you are presenting to an executive and your whole summary should be only on one slide right? So Toastmasters came in, and then what I learned there also came in, and then feedback on what is so important that you want this person to know also came in. So those are the things that I, I, I try to put together and navigate. Um, in, in terms of your second question, yes, it was a male-dominated, um, mining is male-dominated, but I have to say that, interestingly, those that have helped me along the way have been men, Okay, so, and that's the, that's the interesting part. I mean, Bob Powell helped me out. He's a, he's, a, he's a man. My last job that I got, like with Valley, it was a woman that interviewed me with a man and Claire uh, did a really great job, looked at me and said, Monica, I think um, this is yours. I see that um, you can be able to do that. Okay, but throughout it's always been um, with men. What I've also seen is that um, it is male dominated. So sometimes you see a lot of, males in positions. I think that is changing. Now you see that there's a lot of women coming in. And I know Teresa might probably be online. Teresa does a lot of our diversity and inclusion where we are looking at bringing in leaders and things like that. And I think it's changing even in the oil 
and, and gas as well, where now you see more women um, in, in positions than it was. But for us to be able to get to that, it also means that more women should be in engineering, okay? If you look at recent data, it is actually declining. So if more women decline, and sometimes they come into the engineering field, they don't stay in the engineering field, they move away. So if there's less women and more men, obviously that's what you're gonna see where it's always male dominated. So this is a challenge for the kids coming up. Please um, join engineering and let's keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other question here? Okay. So Monica, thank you very much for being with us in, in this seminar. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, just quick announcement. Next week, we are going to have a former professor of this school, Professor Maurice Dussault, a worldwide expert in geomechanics. So hopefully see you here, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you.